Hi, Gary Chillingworth here for Ego Magazine, Shooting and Country TV. Welcome to Life at the Range. Well, I hope today's video will be interesting, and it's for those people who are thinking about getting into HFT, but don't quite know the rules. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at basically everything. What kind of gun you can use, what the scope rules are, what the rules are for actually in the competition, distances, you name it, hopefully we'll have a look at it. Now, for those of you who don't know me, um, I used to be the Chief Marshal for UKHFT for the last 15 years. Um, I've now given up that role, it's been taken over by the wonderful Steve O'Mara. Um, he's like me, just Northern. And if you need any more information, then the place to go is www.ukahft.org. Now, the stuff I'm gonna give to you today, it should be accurate for 2023 or before, but obviously if I get something wrong, let me know. Um, the place to go is the aforementioned website. So today is a guide, but please don't get to a competition and say, well, Gary said, because they'll just say, yeah, don't listen to that idiot and they'd be 100% correct. So let's get on with looking at the gun, which is what we're gonna do first and what kind of rifles you can use in the UK HFT. Thanks for joining us here at the range. Okay, so rifles. If you want to shoot in HFT, what kind of rifle can you use? Well, Pete Sparks, who's the basically the founder member of the UK HFT, the guy who pretty much brought it to its fore, always used to say anything from a GAT to an EV2, or maybe these days a GAT to an XTI. And that is essentially true, although I'll be honest with you, if you turn up with a GAT gun pistol, you're not going to get very far. Anything that is sub 12 foot pounds, that's under 12 foot pounds. Now, some of you have got FAC air rifles, um, hunting rifles that you need a license for. And I've been asked in the past, if we've got one of these and we turn it down to sub 12 foot pound, can we use it? The answer is no. It has to be a dedicated sub 12 foot pound air rifle and you will probably get chronoed at a UKA HFT event to make sure that you are legal. So, a lot of guns come with aftermarket stocks, like this one. So, are there any rules on that? Well, yes. From the middle of the barrel to the very lowest point of the stop depth, 150 millimeters. That is the maximum you can have. We have a butt pad on the back. Now, as you know, a lot of us shoot laying on the ground and we rest the rear of the rifle on the floor. Only this section, the very, very rear part, can touch the ground. No other part of the rifle. The pistol grip cannot touch the ground. The hamster cannot touch the ground. Also, on some rifles, you've got like the paddle shape, where you've got a paddle coming in, going down to the flat, and then a paddle coming out. So measuring from the flat to the very furthest point, depending on whether, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got spaces or whatever, but from here to there is currently two and a quarter inches but keep an eye on that because there are some rifles coming out the factory that are apparently two and a half. So that is looking to possibly be amended. But at the moment, it is two and a quarter inches from the flat to the very furthest point. Now, some rifles are magazine based, like the HW100, and they've got a multi shot magazine. Well, this magazine has to be removed in between lanes. So you take your shot, you take the magazine out, you put it in your pocket, you put it back in, and you're good to go. But what a lot of people do, certainly with the HW100s or anything that is multi-shot, they put in a single shot magazine or a single shot adapter, turning it into a single shot rifle. That is a much easier way of doing it. Some rifles are fitted with a Windicator. This is a basically a piece of string or wool or something like that that hangs off the front of the rifle. That can't be more than 12 inches long and they use that for gauging wind. The other thing that some rifles come with are spirit levels. Now, we don't mind if a spirit level is attached to your rifle, but that must be taped up because people can use them, you know, to adjust, you know, to work out what kind of angle you're shooting at. The other thing is slings. Um, you get a sling which will attach to the front and go to the back. And what you, all that is for is for carrying the rifle. What you're not allowed to do is wrap the sling around your arm for a standing shot and to use it to brace yourself. So a sling can only be used to carry the rifle and it can be not to used uh, to make you more stable.
The next thing we have is telescopic sights and you can use everything from a 24mm um, MTC Connect up to a 50mm Night Eye Digital depending on whether or not you're capable of seeing the target because the rule in HFT is once you've taken your first shot you're not allowed to adjust the scope at all you can't touch the magnification or the parallax now the problem is sometimes when you get scopes with very large objectives 50 mils you know 60 mils you might be able to see a target at 30 35 yards but when you look at one at 45 it'll be blurry as anything and if you look at the eight yard target you won't even be able to see the target let alone the kill zone that's why a lot of people within the hft world stick to between 32 and 42 millimeters that gives you a depth of field that is long enough for you to see now one thing you cannot do and it's if you look at this rifle i've got a scope maximizer on the back and i've got a sunshade on the front and both of these items are designed to be outside of the reticule sorry reticule outside of the objective and of the ocular end so they don't reduce it in size what you can't do is turn this 40 millimeter scope into a 30 millimeter scope by blocking part of the lens that would increase your depth of field but it's not allowed in hft scope maximizers at the rear are legal because um, they help cut out the sun but you can't use something like an accu cover which is a you know it's, it's, it's like a scope cover with little yellow dots to help you make sure you're not canting the rifle so basically things like scope maximizers and sunshades are good but you're not allowed to not allowed to reduce the objective or the ocular end size so if you've got flip up covers you're not allowed to drill a hole in them and you shoot them with them down because that's a big no-no although it does work um again you're not allowed to adjust anything on the scope once you've taken your first shot now illuminated reticules are legal a lot of people use them and some scopes like the march what they do is they switch off after 20 minutes now if you've got a scope where you've got a reticle that switches off you need to tell your shooting partners before you start my scope switches off so i'm going to need to switch it back on so then when it does turn off you say to your shooting partners my scope switched off and you just click it back on but basically if you're shooting with it on every shot must be taken with it on i'm just going to check my piece of paper make sure i haven't missed anything because i have the memory of a goldfish okay the other thing about scopes is that when you get your uh, card you know your scorecard you'll notice that you have to write down the information so you have to write down the parallax this is what is written on the side unless it's a fixed parallax unless you write fixed your magnification um, time so i'm currently shooting on 12 mag so write down your scope information um, sometimes a lot of people write down the make so for if for instance if i was shooting this particular scope which i am at the moment i would write optisan cp 3 by 12 by 40 and 25 parallax write that on the scorecard because if a marshal comes to check your card and the information isn't there you could receive a penalty but that's pretty much it for scopes nice and easy okay so when we're at the peg take my glasses off when we're laying down at the peg there's a couple of rules that we need to know this is your friend and as such your friends always like to be touched and as such either your gun your hand your leg some part of your body must always touch the peg when you're going to take your shot you can come up the peg you can rest on top of the peg if you if you if you can but basically some part of your body must touch the peg at all times as we said earlier when you're laying down the pistol grip you must be able to place your hand underneath underneath here and the rear of the rifle is the only bit that can touch the the mat now mats are in, interesting the mat is here purely to insulate you from the ground what you're not allowed to do is with the mat the bean bag or a jumper you're not allowed to rest on that to give you extra height because what we've seen in the past is somebody to take their mat fold it up to give them height here to give them extra height 
when they've got to come up the peg. That's not allowed. Now, again with the peg, you've got two types of peg. You've got your standard 12 inch peg. Then you've got a tiny peg, and then you've got a higher one for elevator shots. Now, a standard peg should be 12 inches, but if you've missed the target and then you get your tape measure out and you measure it out at three and 11 and three quarters, don't call a marshal and go, I want this peg pulled, this target pulled, because the peg is a quarter of an inch too low because you're going to get abused and sort of told off and people will look at you with disgust. If you've got a peg that's like really short, before you take the shot, you can call the marshal and they can maybe swap the peg out. Now, if you've got a high elevated target, you'll get, an, I think it's an 18 inch peg, which is considerably higher. And if you've got an unsupported shot, the peg should be four inches, no more. And that designates a, a shot that is unsupported. You'll only have two of those for on the course, and that's for your kneelers and for your un, sorry, unsupported kneelers and unsupported standers. So four, 12, and I think it's 18, but they might be an inch or so shorter and if they are just let some you know if you want to make someone aware of it but they're not going to pull a target over it um it's a field sport and the people are doing this voluntary okay so you're at the peg and somebody calls a ceasefire now what is a ceasefire when you're on the course you will have either marshals with whistles or there'll be a klaxon if you're a national event if you hear a single blast of the whistle or you hear somebody shout ceasefire you fire the rifle off eight yards into the ground downrange. And you say to your colleagues, I'm firing off. Bang, do it safely. You don't sit there with a loaded rifle because there might now be marshals out on the course. Once the ceasefire is over, you will get two whistles, which will tell you to start. And at the end of the comp, when everyone's finished shooting, you'll get three whistles, three whistles which means everything is over. However, and I'll give you a perfect instance. We were shooting at the lovely Thaden the other day. And all of a sudden, somebody saw somebody walking across the back in direct line of fire. They didn't wait for marshals to call. They shouted, cease fire, cease fire. Or if you've got a whistle with you, blow the whistle. Anyone can call a cease fire at any time for safety reasons. So if you think there's a reason that something's coming in that's unsafe, call a cease fire, call for a marshal. No one will ever criticize you, even if you're wrong. We would always rather you be safe. Call a ceasefire, we'll start again. So anyone can call a ceasefire at any peg. time. I said a minute ago that um, you usually have a peg and you have a firing line. The trigger must always be behind the peg. What you can't do is you can't sort of come forward like that to give you a bit of an extra range. So the trigger must always be behind the peg, peg and firing line. So this is the interesting thing. In HFT, we score two points for a kill, one point for a plate, and zero for a miss. Now, sometimes you will take a shot, you will think you've hit the middle of the kill zone, and the target has not fallen. 99 times out of 100, what has actually happened is you've split it where half of the pellet has gone into the kill zone and half has ended up on the plate. And you just hadn't had enough energy to push the target over but if you want to get the target checked that's absolutely fine call for a marshal they will call a ceasefire and they will go out with a target checker and they will check the target now before you call the marshal put your gun down do not touch the string don't start trying to pull it or reset it and the marshal won't touch the string either you've got to leave everything down range exactly as it was when you've shot it now I say be sensible about this. If you're the third one or fourth one in a group and your three people before you have all shot it and killed it and the people off before them have all shot it and killed it and you've got down and you've shot it and it's on a windy day, chances are you've just missed it. So be sensible. But if you're shooting in a group and everybody's missed it and you swear that you've seen it go down, call a marshal over because the string might have got caught up, the target might have failed. The marshal will walk out, he'll check the target after he's called a ceasefire, he'll come back and he will tell you what's happened. Now, if for some reason the target has failed and he's able to repair it, they will fix the target or replace the target and you will receive two points, but only you will receive two points. 
the people who shot it before you they had the opportunity to call that target they chose not to so they've got to accept their consequences so only the person who calls the target gets the two points and that is very very important the other thing to remember is if you're in a if you're shooting and you've forgotten to load a pellet and you've taken a shot and it's gone bang air has gone from the barrel you can't say sorry i didn't load a pellet i'm going to take another one the very second the air leaves that barrel your shot is taken no arguments if air leaves that shot taken that is why when you're doing a ceasefire or you're firing off you must say to your opponents i'm firing off and let them know what you're doing because if you don't you score a zero though them are the rules and the other thing to remember with this is it is two minutes per shot now the two minutes start when you approach the peg so you walk up to the peg you put your mat down you lay down you take your shot two minutes from when you approach the peg to when the shot is fired not put your mat down go back get your crib sheet do this have a little look and then put your eye to the scope on oh, my two minute starts now no that's that's not how it works the minute you start approaching your time starts we've got to keep everything flowing and and that's fine now the other thing you are allowed to do apart from having mats and things like that is you're allowed a crib sheet this one gives me information on the list on my head bob which i'm using for range finding the size of 15 mil kills and all of my aim points it's also worth having a a section uh, written on there with all your rules you know your distances you know what distances can the targets go out to and that's what we'll go into next okay so target distances the smallest targets we shoot at are 15 millimeters or between 15 and 19 millimeters to be precise you will get between four and six of those on a course and they can be anything from 13 to 25 yards the next is 20 millimeters and they can go anything from 8 to 30 yards and you usually get two of these on a course the next are well say 20 millimeters so 20 to 24 millimeters to be precise the next are your 25 to 34 millimeters and these are the ones that can go from anything from 8 to 40 yards and usually you will get let me just double check usually you'll get four of these on a course and then everything else should be uh, anything from being 35 to 45 millimeters realistically you never get 45 millimeter targets on a course I haven't seen one in years but most of them will be 35 or 40 mils and again 40 mils are quite rare a lot of them are 35 these days and they can go anything from 8 to 45 yards these are all your prone targets now you then get one unsupported stander that has to be a 35 millimeter target and that can go from 8 to 35 yards or an unsupported kneeler and that again 35 millimeter target 8 to 35 yards and the unsupported kneeler can be taken standing if you wish you'll then get the supported shots now you'll get a stand only target and this has got to be a 25 mil to 34 mil target and this can only go out as far as 30 yards the rest will be kneel or standers and most of these will be 35 mils and one of them can go out to 40 yards now again all kneeling shots can be shot supported standing or unsupported if you wish um but yeah uh, that is pretty much it so you've got well your... i'm just taking a little break from doing the edit and one thing we've got to look at is like the kneeling and the standing rules now the problem is the video is getting up nearly 40 minutes long and if i add the kneeling and the standing stuff into it it's going to be nearly an hour and also i've made some videos all on the rules of kneelers and standers and how to do them so i'm not going to add the kneeling and standing rules within this video but i will put links in the description below to the kneeling and standing videos and that's going to give you way more advice and help uh, than i can do within this video also it will cut the, uh, the the amount of time we're yapping uh, down by a bit so go and check that out so if you need more information on kneeling standing the rules behind it and how to do it properly and um, hopefully that will help you cheers okay 
So now let's look at peripherals. Glasses. You can certainly shoot with your glasses on, but what you can't do is take some shots with your glasses on, some shots with your glasses off. So you have to make a decision. On or off, I shoot with glasses, but I take them off at each shot. You're allowed to range find with your glasses on, but once your eye goes to the scope, it has to be one or the other, and it's usually worth telling your shooting colleagues what you're doing. Gloves certainly are allowed, and I would strongly recommend it. This is an Anschutz 110. SureShot makes some great gloves, um, but they will help you with grip, and they will be absolutely superb. Shooting jackets. Now, the FT tile gimp jackets made out of tough leather, the Olympic style, we're not allowed to wear. You can't have anything that helps to support you. And again, what you can't do is unzip your jacket and put the rifle inside, certainly on standards. The rifle always has to be on the outside of your jacket. You can certainly wear hats, you know, that'll help keep the sun out. Some people wear a shooting glass where it covers up one of the eyes. If there's something you're not sure about, speak to your marshals and they will guide you. Um, as I said, it's always worth speaking to a marshal and just asking that if what you're doing is legal. And apart from that, it's a fairly easy way of, of, of shooting. Okay, so let's have a little chat about marshals. Marshals are all volunteers. They're people who've come into the sport and who want to give something back, a bit like call setters. I'd strongly recommend that no matter what your level, go and have a go at some marshalling. Speak to your club officials, go on a marshalling course. Most clubs should like, show you how to do it. But the most important thing is be nice to marshals. Um, they don't get paid for it. They get a load of abuse and if they get something wrong you just have to accept it you know i was chief marshal for 15 years did i get everything right no i made the occasional mistake and if you're a marshal and you've made a mistake you've just got to put your hands up to it and and let the senior people figure out what is right to do but never ever give any grief to a marshal because anyone who does abuse a marshal will be thrown off the course and rightfully so you know, these are people who have come out to shoot tin chickens. Don't get too stressed and just look, be kind, be nice to your marshals. They're doing the best they can. And sometimes these rules can be a little bit com complicated. So no barrack room lawyers, please. If that's you, stay at home. Don't abuse our marshals. Thank you. Okay. Within HFT, we like to be as inclusive as we possibly can. And we have many different types of shooters. We have open class, which are usually your PCPs. You have the spring gun class, which is you know what I love shooting. You've got the 2-2 class, then you've got your junior class, which is your youngsters, 9 to 16. It's worth, if you've got a child who's under 9, speak to your local club. Some clubs have insurance that will allow them before 9, but most clubs are 9 to 16. Um, we have the ladies class. Now, I had a great email the other day saying, why have we got a ladies class? Aren't ladies every bit as good as, as men? 100%. Look at Theresa Reid. She's one of the top shooters in the country. She scored, scored a perfect 60 at me on the other day. Is she as good as the men? No, she's better than most. In fact, she's almost better than all. Hmm. Why? So why do we have a ladies class? The reason we have a ladies class is a lot of ladies who are coming into the sport, it gives them an automatic like little uh, a little group so that sounds really terrible it gives them a group that they can be part of instantly the ladies who shoot the UK HFT are a great bunch of people and they're welcoming and they're kind and you know they're not horrible people like we are like us blokes they're supportive they're everything you want to do and then after a little while if you shot in a couple of years or if you've won the nationals or whatever most of the ladies end up moving over to open class now some go straight into open anyway um, but the reason it's there is it's there if you want it don't have to go into it but if you're a lady who wants to shoot you can join the ladies class and say they're a great bunch of people 
but they shoot every bit as well as we do. So we've got so we've got the open recoiling ladies juniors, we've got the veterans, which is for anyone over the age of 60, and we've also got the new stick class. And we're gonna go into the stick class in a little while, but we do actually have a proper stick video coming soon now that the rules have been finalized and we sort of know a little bit more about what we're doing. But we're gonna have a little chat about the sticks in a minute. For 2023, the UK HFT has introduced the stick class, and this has become incredibly popular incredibly quickly. It seems to be adopted um, from clubs all over the country are really getting behind it. And but what's you know for what is it and, and why are people using it? Well, the beauty of the stick class is the fact that it doesn't mean you have to get up and down from each peg. Every shot from the stand onlys to the prone shots are all shot from the sticks. And what are the sticks? Well, you can get monos, you can get bipods, but realistically, everybody uses a tripod. And that's usually either a Primos Gen 2 or a Primos Gen 3, or any kind of stick that you could have. Some people are even making their own. But there are a few rules. There are some types of sticks where you can clamp your rifle. These are not allowed. The rifle has to sit on top of the stick and be able to move forward and back. You can of course clamp the rifle if you wish with your hand. You can grip the stick and grab the rifle. You can put your hand on top and rest the rifle in your hand. That's actually how I personally like to do it. But then again, I suck at shooting sticks. So where do you place your sticks? Well, you walk up to the peg, which is here, and you place your stick over the top of it. So as long as that stick is within the circumference of the legs, that's absolutely fine. And then you pretty much shoot everything the same way as you do with HFT. You don't adjust your scope. Everything's from eight to 45 yards. If you've got an unsupported stander, you shoot it with your stick. Unsupported kneeler with the stick. Everything is off the sticks. You can't pick and choose. Now there may be a couple of targets that will be in front of you and because of the way the call cool setters have set it you can't see it with your stick. Now you will be told about this before the competition starts. Peg 13 you cannot see it from this peg. So to your left hand side or to your right hand side there will be another peg marked stick only. However occasionally there will be a target that you just physically cannot see from anywhere apart from laying on the ground where you are so on those ones unfortunately you don't get to shoot it and you will be given an automatic too the reason that was brought in is every now and then the call setters like to put targets you know through not through pipes but like through bushes and stuff like that and it would detract from the rest of the experience by making those shots illegal. And the stick shooters were spoken to and they all said 100% make the course the way you want to make it and then they will accommodate us. Now who's allowed to shoot sticks? Anyone. If you've come into the sport and you're young and you're fit and you're healthy and you just don't want to be getting up and down or you rock up on a day and it's absolutely chucking it down with rain and there's mud everywhere but you still want to shoot you can have a go at sticks anybody can shoot in the stick class now what happens if you turn up at a shoot and you haven't got a set of sticks but you want to have a go at sticks speak to the organizers and chances are they'll be able to find a stick shooter that they will put you with and you'll be able to share sticks. That's absolutely fine. There is no problems with shooting sticks, but just remember you're using another person's equipment. So a cup of tea is usually the, uh, the order of the day, possibly a bacon sandwich and a thank you, and they'll be always more than welcome to share. But if they don't, then you can't force them, but most will. So that's pretty much it six but we are going to do a dedicated stick video coming up soon but we're going to get the stick boys involved in that because they shoot it week in week out and they'll be able to give you more guidance onto doing this than i can hope that helps
Well, thank you so much for joining us at the range today. And apologies that there wasn't any shooting, but it was an important video to make. Huge thanks as ever to Crawley Shooting Supplies who like take care of us and they sponsor the video, surplusstore.co.uk. And big thanks to the UK HFT who you know, allow us all to shoot and you know, you'll never spend a better 15 quid in your life. You know, you've got three or four hours shooting and you've got a lovely bunch of people and it's a brilliant event. So go to ukhft.org for all your information. Next shoot's at Throckmorton, which should be absolutely amazing. Very, very soon we've got the new Airgun World slash Airgunner magazine being released, which is like the new hybrid of the two. And don't forget, there are still some excellent deals for subscriptions where you get two million pounds worth of free shooting insurance please like share subscribe as ever and thank you so much for joining us here at the range we'll see you again very very soon stay safe shoot well and take care of each other Ta -da.